Okay, to stay on track, let's uh, go ahead and dive into our next session. Um, the second one of the, I'm going to call it the morning um, uh, panel of our uh, visual politics pre-conference. And next up is uh, Christian Vicari on visual misinformation and global perspective platforms, devices, and users. Uh, everybody should be able to see his screen. And Christian, it's all yours. Hi everyone, um, I'm really glad um, to present after uh, Ronald's talk because you know I want to hope that the project I'm going to present is definitely funky uh, and it's definitely been an interesting learning curve for uh, all of us involved. Uh, so this project brings together scholars from eight different countries, uh, myself, um, Andy Ross, uh, Patricia Rossini, Raquel Requeiro, Eugenio Gagliardone, Nicole Sremlau, uh, Shirad Virgvisman, and Michael Chen. And we're interested in, in, we're interested in studying all these important countries in a comparative uh, project that I suppose you could call a most different systems design for those who are familiar with the lingo. Uh, this project was funded by Facebook uh, last year with an unrestricted gift as part of their uh, Facebook Integrity Research Program. Uh, an unrestricted gift meaning that uh, they don't have any oversight on uh, what we decide to do and write about. Uh, we don't get any Facebook data, however. Um, so what we're interested in doing is uh, uh, exploring some aspects that shouldn't be uh, controversial with this group. The fact that visual content uh, enjoys uh, some cognitive advantages over textual information, as was pointed out by someone in the uh, chat earlier, uh, is more likely to be treated as realistic by people who see it. Um, people are more likely to evaluate verbal content as true if it is, a comp if it, if it is accompanied by related images uh, because, as psychologists argue, it created uh, fluency. Um, visual content has also been found to reduce misperceptions uh, more than textual information, and it is more likely to be shared on social media, as uh, social media companies know very well, and that's why they try to push it all the time. So we have a set of research questions for this project, way more complicated than I can discuss today and probably even way more complicated than we can actually answer right now. Uh, but I'm going to focus on one uh, simple, but I think important research question. Is visual misinformation more memorable, credible, and shareable than textual uh, misinformation? So we're interested, of course, in misinformation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about misinformation as a field of research. There is obviously an explosion of uh, 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 research and great published articles on misinformation these days. Uh, we're interested in understanding whether visual uh, uh, content contributes to misinformation in a unique and specific way compared to text. Uh, this is pretty much a work in progress. Uh, we ran a couple of pilots in the spring of 2019 uh, on US samples uh, provided by Poultrix uh, with quotas to make sure that the samples are broadly similar to the US uh, population connected to the internet. Um, we are at the moment uh, almost ready to launch a rather another round of uh, broader data collection. Uh, and that's also why I would be really interested in hearing your feedback about uh, what we're doing right now. So today I'm going to present some results from this uh, second pilot, which is based on uh, 592 responses. Um, so the way it works uh, is we are running experiments um, so a rather conventional social science research method, but uh, trying to understand the role of visuals, which as discussed earlier, is not necessarily something that a lot of people have done. Uh, so first we measure a few pre-treatment measures, a few measures like, you know, demographics and issue positions. Uh, then uh, we randomly assign each participant to four out of five different treatments, uh, which each of which is on a different topic, which is seen on a random order. And then whenever you're assigned to one topic, you will see one treatment uh, in one of three different styles, uh, which we call text, meme, and text plus image. And I'm going to show that uh, in a minute. Um, if you're not assigned to seeing one issue, you serve as a control group for that issue. Uh, then we have some measures uh, that are both specific uh, and general to uh, 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 views and attitudes toward uh, both the treatment people have seen and uh, the content of that treatment more generally. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk more specifically about these shortly. And then there is a debrief where we tell people that uh, the stuff they've seen is not true because all the treatments entail information that is uh, to some degree false and debunked by fact checkers. So these are the three styles that we use in our treatments. Uh, these are mock-ups of Facebook posts. 
Um, in one case, uh, we only show information that is textual. That's the text version. In the second case, we use an information in the format of memes as they're you know, conventionally understood in contemporary internet culture. And in the third format, we uh, combine textual and, and image uh, uh, and visual content in a single image. So these are the kinds of um, cropped up uh, 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 images that you might see, you know, because a friend of yours shares it on WhatsApp, for example, or on, on other messaging platforms. Um, so we wanted to see whether essentially the text only content had different effects compared to the other uh, two types of contents that include images. We had five different topics. Uh, we chose them so that two would be roughly more favorable for Republicans and two roughly more uh, favorable for Democrats. So we got immigration um, with some misinformation about the fact that illegal immigrants get a lot of federal benefits. We've got one about Muslims, uh, where people have argued that in uh, 20 years, you know, there will be enough Muslims. We have uh, a treatment about sick leave and the fact that the United States is the only country in the world that doesn't, the only advanced rich economy in the world that doesn't provide sick leave. Um, we have one on school shootings and the number of people killed in school shootings since Sandy Hook, uh, which was a terrible school massacre in the United States in 2012. And with phones in the night uh, causing people uh, eye cancer. Now, all of these are false. None of this is true. They've all been debunked by fact checkers. Uh, so if you participated in our experiment, you would be assigned to see four out of five of these uh, contents, and you would see them in one, in one of these three uh, styles. Now, um, we measured whether people would be likely to share the treatment. We measured whether people believe that the treatment, uh, the content of the treatment was uh, true or false. And then we, after the, uh, after people had seen all the treatments, we asked them in general, posts on social media or a messaging app that contained the same claim. And we do this specifically because that a lot, the, the last two measures, we asked them about uh, all the contents, not only the contents on which people saw treatment, but also the contents on which people didn't see the treatment. And that enables us to have a sort of a control group uh, within subject. So these are some results. Uh, these are uh, OLS regressions uh, predicting. Um, so if you see any bars that are uh, to the left or to the right of the zero, the dashed line, uh, these are statistically significant coefficients. So as we can see here, uh, basically what you're willing to share is largely a function of whether you agree with the content, uh, which is no surprise. Um, so people are more likely to share these uh, misinforming uh, treatments if they agree with the purpose of the misinformation. Uh, there is a significant coefficient for meme when compared to text. So. Uh, when it comes to smartphones, people were more likely to share the meme than they were likely to share the text. Uh, but the effects are generally not, the coefficients are generally not statistically significant. Obviously, this is not a high power study. This was a pilot. The coefficients are almost all in the right direction, meaning that they, they suggest that people are more likely to share visual than textual content, but the effects are not, but they're not significant. And here we can see them uh, in you know, a little better. When it comes to uh, believing uh, the, the treatment, we can see that, again, issue position is the most important factor, right? If you already believe, for example, that there are too many Muslims in America, you're more likely to believe that Muslims will be able to elect the president in 20 years. When it comes to the uh, effects of the different treatments, uh, we have some effects for uh, the topics of uh, workers' rights and gun control where uh, the people uh, who saw these treatments were more likely, uh, who saw these treatments in visual formats were more likely to uh, believe them than the people who didn't see them. Uh, but also the people that saw the, the treatments in the textual format were more likely uh, to be willing to share them. And the same goes for immigration. Uh, so again, uh, visual content makes a difference, but it doesn't seem to make such a bigger difference compared to text. Um, and finally, when it comes to generally being willing to share treat, uh, content that uh, uh, reinforces the same message, again, issue positions by far matter the most. 
And when it comes to the uh, style of the treatment, people saw, uh, again, um, not a lot of positive, not a lot of significant coefficients, although most coefficients are, uh, you know, of the right sign. Um, and when it comes to, uh, only when it comes to uh, gun control, we see that there are some significant coefficients. But again, uh, both for the visual treatments and for the textual treatment, when compared to the control group that didn't see anything at all. Uh, we also did some moderation and mediation models. So, for example, one of the things we asked people in the pre-test was um, whether they prefer to learn visually versus verbally. And we did find that the people who prefer visual uh, rather than textual content are more likely to believe the visual treatments and share the contents of the visual treatment. And also, the more likely you are to believe the treatment, uh, the more likely you are to share it uh, afterwards, which makes sense. So we've learned a few things from this pilot, uh, which we're implementing in our broader fieldwork. Uh, first, we learned, which you know we already kind of knew, but we confirmed that even when it comes to visuals, uh, visuals matter when they're reinforced priors, when they confirm what people already think. Uh, we learned that there is a difference between different issues. Uh, and so there is not a uniform effect of these treatments across issues, but it varies uh, depending on the content. We've learned that the effects of visual treatments are slightly stronger than the effects of textual treatments, but the differences are small. So uh, we're going to run a more, uh, a better powered study um, soon to you know, be better able to detect these effects with smaller errors. Uh, but we anticipate that these effects are not going to be huge. Of course, they would be, they could be huge if they are cumulative, right? If, if, if people see a lot of visual treatments, but in the, in the context of a one shot laboratory, study these effects are small uh, as we expect them to be in communication right this is this has long been known in communication research so the next steps we're gonna we've decided to take based on this and again i would be very interested in hearing some feedback from you either right now or afterwards uh, first of all we're going to simplify our experimental treatments so we're gonna only have a textual version and a textual plus visual version we're not going to have memes anymore because we reason that memes are too culturally complex to be to be treated as a simple variation of the textual content. Um, we're going to have more topics. Since we found that topics make a difference, we will have eight topics rather than five. Uh, we will measure uh, how people report their emotions after the treatments, after seeing the treatments. Uh, this is not something that we measured in the pilots, but we got you know, very useful feedback from colleagues. And uh, we understood, we realized that we need to understand whether there is a relationship between emotional activation and images and whether that has any effects on the outcomes we're interested in. Um, for this purpose, we have pre-tested our new treatments uh, choosing different images um, for uh, each topic so that we know which ones elicit high levels of negative emotions and which ones elicit low levels of negative emotions. And finally, we have a challenge that we're going to have to deal with, which is we're going to go in the field in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the United States. So uh, this is obviously COVID uh, era, and uh, we thought about whether we should completely stop our project um, and you know, postpone field work to a time when people would be in a more normal situation. But the reality is we don't really know when that's gonna happen. And so we're just gonna bite the bullet and go ahead and get in the field and try to understand whether you know, the situation related to COVID has any effects on our findings by asking people a few questions before the treatments uh, about their experience with COVID, and also by leveraging the fact that because we're running this, this study in the United States, uh, different states in America will have different policies in terms of the lockdown and different public health situations. So that's it for me. I very much look forward to your comments and questions, and thanks very much for listening. That's a, that's a great closing image there of the, the manuscript writer. Um, we do have a couple questions, uh, and so um, some methodological ones. When designing the stimuli, did you include any community cues, like number of shares, comments, reactions that the post received? No, um, we, we grade them out, um, and this was a conscious choice because uh, either we, you know, we, we could have you know, either come up with a number and that would have been constant across each uh, stimulus, uh, but that would have been arbitrary, or we could have varied that as well, uh, but that would have introduced uh, a few other uh, permutations that would have required even more statistical power than, than we have. So at the moment, they're all grayed out, which obviously reduces realism because that's not the context in which people see them. 
uh, but we thought you know we, we we would go for the purity of being able to isolate a particular variable and operationalize it. But the, that does suggest you consider them a powerful queue if you're blurring them out. Well, you know there is there is some evidence that that they are uh, other that they are some other that they aren't. Uh, I think you know it's it's an ongoing debate. Um, you know I think intuitively they must matter to some degree. Uh, but it's also the case that people are seeing these cues in a lab setting where you know the message is coming from a no one technically, like somebody that who has their image and name blurred out and not somebody they know. Uh, so that's already a powerful you know deviation, an important deviation from reality. Right. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, Lucas Otto was wondering what the specific misinformation factor of your study is, and are you going to have a non-misinformation condition in future studies? I guess that would be uh, the equivalent of factual um, to study the interaction between misinformation and visuals. Yeah, this is something we've thought about very carefully, and at this stage, we're only going to use uh, treatments that include in misinformation. Obviously, we debrief people at the end abundantly that you know they shouldn't believe this stuff. Um, and, and the main reason why we want we decided to do this is that we want to test for different issues, and if we only had one non-misinforming treatment, what would that issue be? Right? Would it be? taxes would it be health would it be foreign policy it's every you know issue, as we found issues make a difference and so we felt if we really wanted to do it this properly we would have to have an equal number of issues where you have misinformation and, and and correct information and again to do that would have complicated this what is already a pretty complicated experimental design i think in if we find what we think we're going to find with this field work then a follow-up study would compare the effects of visuals across misinforming and, and, and correctly informing uh, treatments. Okay, another question. Um, Lindsay asks, I was just wondering um, why you use misinformation over disinformation? Uh, sure, well, I mean, the, the, this is a, a debate that I'm very familiar with. And, uh, you know, normally we consider misinformation as being uh, unintentional sharing of inaccurate information and disinformation as being intentional sharing of inaccurate information. Now, for the purposes of, our, of an experiment, uh, you know, we, the, the, this, this is a, a distinction that relies on the ability to understand the intention of the person who is sharing that information, right? If I know that it's false, it's disinformation. If I don't know it's false and I'm sharing it in good faith, it's misinformation. Um, so for us, it doesn't really matter because we are exposing people to a treatment and we are, you know, the, the person who is, there's no one who is actually sharing it. And so there's no point in, in thinking about whether it's misinformation or disinformation. I guess if we were, uh, you know, if, if we were to be conceptually uh, um, comprehensive, we would have to always say that this could be misinformation or disinformation, depending on who shares it in the real world. But because we're not in the real world, uh, that distinction is, 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 less, is less relevant here. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. I don't know if we're going to have time to get to all of them, but this has generated a lot of discussion. Um, are you going to include real and fake images and real or fake narratives in your um, future iterations? And also describe how you decide on these topics and these particular memes. Sure. Well, in terms of the images, we, I mean, the, these originally, we wanted to only include memes that had already been circulated in, in, in social media. Um, and we decided, we realized quickly that if we were gonna do that, we would lose a lot of the control that you have as in an experiment. Because um, you know, people choose images in ways that don't necessarily, in the real world, they choose images in ways that don't necessarily, uh, are not necessarily informed by desire to test the theory, right? So, for example, in those images that, that I showed you, uh, the, the one for sick leave was a map of uh, the world where the United States was a black uh, uh, splash of color. Um, and that was very, very different from the image we were using for you know, gun control, where we had you know, the people laying shoes at Capitol Hill in protest against gun violence in schools. And we realized that we were introducing a lot of differences by choosing these different images. So, We've tried to be a bit more disciplined. Uh, you know, there's no grammar, there's no code book for images for what constitutes <laughs> image content. And this is one thing that you know we should probably all work towards, I guess. 
Uh, but we realized, you know, we were choosing images pretty much at random. So we've tried to be a bit more disciplined and choose images that are a bit more comparable in what they show across different treatments, because then we don't know if the effects are due to the topic or they're due to the image. Um, so these images are all, you know, we, we've chosen from, you know, publicly available sources. Um, we haven't chosen it from, you know, alt-right or alt-left websites. In terms of the issues, we've basically gone with what the fact checkers were covering and what we thought were the clearest verdicts in a given period. So, you know, we, we studiously avoided um, false statements. So a lot of fact checkers in the U.S., uh, they will debunk things like, you know, Donald Trump never said this or Barack Obama never said this because in U.S., uh, online circles, it's very common to have these false memes of uh, people with, you know, quoted uh, statements next to their picture saying, oh, look at what, look at this crazy statement that this person has made, uh, which is actually not very common in, in Europe, for, for one. Uh, but we thought we wanted to take out the politician's personality of the experiment, right? We thought if we have a, a statement, a false statement by Trump, that we expose people to, they will react based on how they feel about Trump much more than how they feel about the issue. So that was one criteria. And the other criteria was just, you know, covering issues that we thought based on public opinion analysis and based on the fact checkers reports uh, that were salient and that were on which misinformation was actually circulating in, in the real world in, in, in the US. And obviously we'll do the same for all the other countries we're interested in. Great. Let me hold you up there. We've got more questions. Uh, if you could take the time to answer them. Of course. Uh, yeah. Afterwards. And then if you could unshare your screen, appreciate it. And we'll move on to the next uh, presentation with Isabella Glogger on I Spy With My Eye, Influences of Camera Shots and Voters Party Affiliation on Candidate Evaluation and Televised Debates. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk about a presentation or a study I conducted with uh, Lucas Otto from the University of Amsterdam and uh, Jürgen Meyer and Jennifer Best from the University of Copeland's Lando, who should be also somewhere in this virtual crowd here. Um, so we conducted a study also on televised debates. We heard something about that earlier, but in our study, we didn't focus on facial expressions or these kind of things. We focused on visual editing techniques like camera shots or camera uh, angles. Um, Coming briefly to uh, the background of our study, so um, televised debates are, have been a massive success all over the world and also in Germany where we conducted our study. Um, could you, can you see the normal screen or is it my, okay, perfect, because I have some, I see it twice. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so they have been a massive success also in Germany where we conducted our study. Um, um, however, uh, most studies on televised debates focus on verbal content such as um, strategies, rhetoric strategies or the issues the candidates talk about. And also they focus on the effects of this verbal content, like the effects of strategies on um, the evaluation of candidates or even uh, voting decisions in the long run. Um, but which is kind of surprising and I think we've heard it earlier um, so far the the visual aspect of televised debates have been overlooked and it's really surprising because um, televised debates are campaign events that are particularly suited for um, TV which is per se an audiovisual medium um, so we wondered whether we can find actually effects of um, visual editing techniques such as um, cuts shot sizes or zooms um, on the evaluation of um, candidates and indeed we can find or we could find some studies on presentation effects we heard about them earlier in the presentation by Devan like for example um, that the um, the camera um, this shot size has an effect on how um, politicians are perceived when they're shown on TV. So in our study, we were particularly interested in the effects of two visual editing techniques, namely um, camera shot sizes and camera angles. Why so? Um, well, first of all, um, camera shot sizes serve as an indicator for the distance between the audience and the politician that is displayed. Like, for example, um, a medium shot that is from the hip upwards gives us more um, of our, a general impression of the person that is displayed on TV. Um, Close-up shots, on the other hand, reveal more about the facial expressions, the emotions people show, um, and so on and so on. Um, on the other side, though, um, if someone gets too close to, to 
you, so to say, uh, you could, or the audience could get the impression of someone invading your personal space, which can, could be perceived as rather unpleasant and therefore gets evaluated negatively by the audience. The second editing technique we have been interested in were horizontal camera angles. So um, the horizontal camera angles decides about the visibility of a person's mimic and also the degree of turning to the audience or not. And both aspects are maximal in frontal shots. I can guess you can tell at the moment that you see a lot of my mimic and you hopefully have the perception of me talking towards you, whereas if I turn to the to the side in, in the profile shot, you don't see my mimic. And I guess it's also a rather unpleasant experience if you have the feeling of me talking to someone else. Um, so um, that means that uh, a profile shot um, probably could uh, mean um, lower evaluation by the audience in televised debates. So, like I said, we have been interested in that and asked therefore in our first research question about the effects of camera shot sizes and camera angles on the evaluation of candidates in televised debates. Um, However, when looking at studies that analyze the effects of verbal content on debates, on the evaluation of the candidates, um, it's, it's established that characteristics of the audience also serve as a moderator for this process. And one example of such characteristics of the audience are party identification. And indeed, it seems reasonable to transfer this observation um, also to the influence or the effects of visual editing techniques. Um, so for example, it was found that the effect of camera shots shot sizes is also dependent or is moderated by the viewer's preference for one or the other candidate. And especially close-ups, like I said, they, you can get the feeling of someone invading your personal space. Um, that can get perceived even less favorable if you don't like the person. And um, that's why we asked in our second research question if there's a difference um, in the effects of the visual editing techniques, camera shot sizes or angle, depending on the party identification of the audience. So we had two uh, research questions and we tried to answer that um, by combining three different method methodological approaches and therefore sources of data. So first we conducted um, a quantitative content analysis of in total four televised debates in Germany and all of them were held between the um, candidate of um, the Conservative Party in Germany, which is the CDU, and the Social Democratic Party, which is the SPD. Both parties are the main big parties in, um, in Germany. Um, for the content analysis, we had two trained coders and not like in the study earlier, um, we didn't use time to discern the debate, but we discerned it um, by editing techniques. So for example, always between two cuts or the start or the end um, of a zoom or a pen, for example. Um, so our coders that did that and then we first asked them to code the visual content that is um, the person, the name of the person that was displayed in the, in the coding unit um, or um, the number of people that were shown. And secondly, they coded for um, the camera shot sizes. Um, for this study um, that I present here, we used three different um, shot sizes. Um, you can see them on the right. We have a long shot that was basically um, all shots where you can see the entire person from feet to, um, the, to the head. Um, we had medium shots that were from the hip upwards. And we also had close-up shots that were like from um, the shoulders upwards. And then our coders also looked for the um, camera angle. And here we distinguish between a profile shot and a frontal shot. And frontal shot was like uh, when you saw the politician, the candidate talking to you directly when both ears could be uh, seen in the, um, the picture. Our second source of data or what we did as a second um, approach was that we uh, used real-time response measurement of the immediate reactions of the candidate or the participants and therefore we invited uh, 150 participants to watch each of the debates in the, in the university laboratory and we equipped them with RTR devices. You can see them in the upper picture. These are little handhold devices and they are used to measure the immediate reactions of the audience uh, for whatever they saw on on the screen in that moment and we measured the direct impression on a scale from one poor to seven um, excellent. So we got a second by second um, measurement for whatever the, um, the, the audience saw um, on the televised debates. 
And third and last, we also surveyed our participants of these um, four uh, lab studies uh, and asked them, uh, amongst others, for their party identification um, or gender or age or other um, characteristics. And through this study, we distinguished them in two broader political camps, so to say, the rather conservative ones and the social democratic green ones. So um, coming to our results, um, I'm going to present the results separately for, as you can see, the CDU candidate and the uh, Social Democratic, the SPD candidates. And these results only include camera shots that were static. So we excluded for, for this analysis, um, we excluded pans and zooms. And um, also we only include um, shots that showed one person that is one individual politician in that moment. Um, yeah, so we uh, applied cross-classified multi-level modeling. Uh, it's a long word for, um, for a, a big table, um, but I'm going to uh, walk you through. So our first research question asked um, about the effects of camera shot sizes, and you see indeed we found one significant effect for the shot size, and um, in this case only for the conservative um, candidate. And here we, we found that uh, when the candidate got displayed in a close-up shot, that, is, that was uh, from the shoulder upwards, um, they got um, better uh, evaluation than someone who was shown from a further away perspective. And again, or we didn't find any uh, significant um, result here for uh, social democratic candidates. Our second research question asked, or we were interested in the effects of the um, viewers uh, party identification. So we looked for interactions in that um, case and indeed we found two. I'm going to um, show you what exactly we found. Yeah, here we go. Um, we see here, especially on th this side, um, the participants who identified themselves with the Social Democrats evaluated their candidate best in a medium shot, um, although they um, evaluated best the opponent candidate, that is the um, conservative candidate, best in a close-up shot. Um, I'm going to say later what I think that means for our study. Um, our second research question asked about the camera angle and again we found one um, significant effect and here uh, like we assumed that people that get uh, filmed from the front get better evaluations um, than people showing being shown from the side. Um, but again we only could find that for the um, conservative candidate. Um, again we looked for interactions and this time we could only find one Again, let's have a closer look. So we found that both profile and frontal shots get higher ratings um, uh, for the uh, um, SPD, the Social Democratic candidates, um, when the, from their own voters, that is, uh, people that identified themselves with the SPD or the Greens. That was a lot. So to sum it up briefly, um, medium shots or camera shot sizes matter. Um, and here medium shots get lower scores than close-up shots. Um, the same holds true for the camera angle. So um, a frontal shot got better um, scores than a profile shot. But in both cases, we could only find that for one candidate or the candidates from one party. However, our um, findings seem to be dependent on the uh, the candidate that was displayed in that moment and also on the party um, identification of the audience. To conclude, while well, we find that visual editing techniques in form of zooms, uh, sorry, uh, camera shot sizes and angles indeed seem to have a met an effect on the evaluation of candidates. However, like I said, these effects seem to be dependent on the displayed candidate themselves as well as characteristics of the audience in our study that was party identification. Uh, what we could not find was that close-up shots, like I said, they potentially invade the personal space and therefore get assessed negatively, um, that they even get assessed more negatively when the person um, that comes closer isn't liked by you, as in this is, yeah, is uh, the candidate of the other party. Mm. That might be explained by one of the limitations that our study come with. So the conservative candidate in all debates was Angela Merkel. Um, so the effects that we found um, or have observed might not be or might be dependent on her Angela Merkel and not her being an, uh, a conservative candidate. 
or they might also even depend on her being a female politicians, politicians since she was the only female candidate in all the debates that we analyzed. So in further studies, we would um, therefore also like to include debates in which the conservative candidate was not Merkel. We have to go back far in time for that, but there was one um, or there's two debates actually where Merkel, uh, where the conservative candidate was not Angela Merkel. And uh, we have first data for that, so we will include that um, later. Um, furthermore, we could only include static shots. Like I said, we ex excluded zooms and pans. Um, however, it's plausible to uh, assume that zoom in, zoom ins, for example, can create an effect of closeness, which might be also have an effect on the evaluation of the displayed person, even more so when the person, for example, isn't liked. And finally, uh, we did not include spoken words. Like I said at the beginning, um, visuals in debates have been overlooked so far, but we shall not make the same mistake and now neglect what the candidates say. Um, so in a future study, and we already have data for uh, with our strategy, so we also did a content analysis of the spoken words in debates. And so in a future step, we will combine the visual editing techniques, the spoken word of the candidates and um, audience characteristics to get a fuller picture for this audio and visual campaign event. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to see some questions. That's great. Um, I think I'll kick it off. So um, some effects were there, some effects weren't there. Um, was there anything you would tweak in a, in a follow up study just methodologically? Um, well, uh, I think the, the biggest flaw is that our uh, that one con candidate was a constant, so to say. It was always Angela Merkel, and I think we have some like interfering effects there of her being um, a, po a female politician, um, of her being in politics for like 10 years when the second or third debate happened. So I think people got used to her, um, and that's probably it might be an explanation why she was liked by even um, the uh, yeah uh, voters for um, the Social Democratic Party. So people got used to her and I think um, well all these experiments were, were live experiments so we should probably also conduct a proper experiment on that to um, actually to manipulate the the candidates party affiliation um, gender um, maybe also um, appearance because we I mean maybe one candidate was uglier than the other one um, so and we couldn't could control for that in an experiment which we obviously could not control in this um, life setting Right. It's always the trade-off between kind of real world validity versus experimental yeah. control. Um, one of the things I wonder uh, with um, structural features where you're looking at camera changes and shot lengths and even um, kind of um, switches between cameras, you know, there's probably effects there. On the other hand, does it matter more? And have you looked at what the candidates are doing and how they are expressing and how active they are, for instance? No, we actually only really looked at the editing techniques like zooms, shots, uh, whatever the angle. Um, it would be great to combine what Devan did in his study with our, our study. So looking for uh, I don't know, the candidates smiling or shaking their heads or um, like all these non-verbal expression, facial expressions they have uh, or they, they had shown during the debate, debates, but we don't have data for that. So that might be an add-on to our study, but I think we, I mean, I, that requires another content analysis for, for the debates, yeah. All right, which is easy to do, right? You can just do that in an afternoon. Of um, course, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I think you found that um, opposition viewers from the other party um, didn't view close-ups negatively um, of, of the target candidate. Uh, and so that suggests that, you know, and, and other people found close-up tends to be flattering if it's not uh, intensely, extremely close-up. And I suppose it also depends on who you're looking at. Um, but just explain that, Did you know, was that unexpected? Um, did you think it was going to go the other direction? Mm, well, yeah, well, I think it's an effect of Merkel and um, not the candidate itself. So um, we have to, to rule that out or have to make in our uh, results that clear that, that the content, what the context of the debate was. And also would we, and we did a, a content or a, or a content analysis where we counted if, um, 
the counted how, how often certain um, techniques were used and um, rarely, or, yeah, rarely there was uh, shots used that actually showed the person like this really super close. Um, so it was a close up from here, which is, I guess, not not too invading to the audience personal space. It would be interesting to see uh, what the evaluations were if someone is really close to um, to you, close to your the audience face, um, but that ba barely exists in televised debates. So um, right. again, maybe an experiment uh, would definitely help here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think in the Zoom context, we would call that the full screen presentation as opposed to the gallery view. Uh, but, you know, and there's an interesting contrast between, you know, kind of the German debate style and then what we've got to in the U.S., which is just the continuous split screen. So there are no camera changes and there's really no shot link differences, except maybe in the town hall debates where they walk around, which creates its own dynamics. Um, so are there, have you seen split screens? Have you coded that? We coded that, but that only happened in one debate, maybe 2013, and mm -hmm. it was never used again or before. Um, and that was not while the candidates were talking, that was only to compare the times they had still left to talk or had talked about um, before that. So we don't use it in, it's not used in German debates. Not the confrontational style of talk, them talking at the same time. No. Yeah, no, we're all about confrontation in the U.S., evidently. <laughs> so um, we're just about out of time. We appreciate that. Um, and look to the chat to see if there's any questions I might have missed. I think most of the questions are still going on about the visual memes. Social media is taking over here. Um, but really appreciate your presentation. And if you could, uh, I think you've already unshared your screen. So we'll move on um, to the next presenter. Thanks much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So I'll just begin with a quick trigger warning because some of the images in this presentation might make for uncomfortable viewing. Um, in an increasingly visual-centered media environment, images play a vital role in telling news stories. Images are considered irrefutable evidence that an event occurred and have been described as visual quotations that help convey the details of events. Susan Sontag has described the act of taking a photograph as participating in another person or things mortality, vulnerability, and mutability. Due to the powerful role that images can play in shaping public memory and perception of events, they can provide a forum for political advocacy and are instrumental in triggering action. An important way in which images serve political purposes is through enabling witnessing. In fact, with the rise of image sharing, the ability to capture images using mobile devices, and an increase in visual communication, the 20th century has been described as a century of the witness. Through image sharing, audiences can witness the pain and distant suffering of others. And by viewing images of war, strife, and conflict, audiences bear witness to these events and occurrences, which implies that they take responsibility for the plight of others, and this in turn compels them to take action. Hence, witnessing involves political engagement on the part of audiences. Within news imagery, the genre of death images is particularly controversial. Reset suggests the death representation has become more sanitized over the years as death images that featured in the news in the past were more graphic than those that are published in contemporary news. Scholars explain this in terms of a rise in death anxiety in the West and heightened sensitivities to death images. So factors that are seen to influence the publication of death images include religious orientation. And Reset suggests that societies that are more religious are more likely to publish death images. So for instance, death images are more prevalent in Catholic countries as opposed to Protestant countries. And an interesting pattern has been observed in death images that where they're published, they're more likely to be of people from foreign countries. Hence, proximity is also a factor that influences publication. There is an ongoing tension around traumatic images and they're quite contentious because they push ethical and moral boundaries. On one hand, commentators argue that such images provide vital documentary evidence with the potential to motivate empathy and just action. On the other hand, they're viewed as exploitative and might even be qualified as war porn. Therefore, their publication is a subject of heated debate. This paper focuses on the publication of photographs of Alan Kurdi, a three-year-old Syrian refugee whose body was found round in a Turkish beach as the boat carrying him and other passengers to Greece capsized. Um, these photographs went viral on social media in September 2015 and were shared 30,000 times within 12 hours on Twitter. 
The photo of Alan lying on the beach was chosen by Time magazine as one of 100 most influential images of all time. Leading news publications around the world carry these images, and internet users also contributed to the narrative by sharing memes featuring Alan in various different contexts. The sharing of his images had a powerful political impact in the sense that it swayed public opinion in favor of refugees, affected changes in discourse around the refugee debate, and caused some countries, most prominently Germany, to loosen their borders to, to refugees. Their publication also caused an increase in donations for Syrian refugees, and the images provoked a lot of discussion around the plight of refugees, but equally around the publication of the image of a dead child. So this paper asked the question, what are the factors that influence the publication of these images in the mainstream media, despite the fact that they violate editorial guidelines? It is expected that insights from these interviews, will, with, from the interviews that are conducted here, will provide a broader understanding of factors that can influence the publication of traumatic images. So as already mentioned, my research method is semi-structured interviews. Uh, which were conducted with 26 journalists and editors based in Australia, New Zealand, and Pakistan. They work across digital print and broadcast media, several of them working across different platforms. And the key criteria was that they were all decision makers who had direct influence over which images are published in their publications and which ones are not. Um, pseudonyms have been used here to protect their confidentiality. Through these interviews, I found that one of the factors that influences image production is replication, or which was described by an Australian participant as the sheep effect. Um, she said that when other news organizations publish an image, there's heightened pressure to do so yourself. When I asked an editor based in Pakistan why he, why he chose to run the images, he answered, because the world ran with it. I think that has started to have a really big impact. The sentiment was echoed by other news professionals as well, implying that news editors take cues from others and are not acting in isolation. Rather, in many cases, they're replicating the behaviors and decision-making of others in the industry. Hence, publications that first use these images set a precedent for others to follow suit. Closely linked to this factor is the second, which is relevance. In the interviews, news professionals expressed a concern with remaining relevant, and the idea of relevance is defined in large part by what is trending on digital media. Therefore, ignoring widely circulated visuals was seen as compromising one's own relevance. A digital news editor based in Pakistan said that if this image is going really, really big, then if you do not use it, it's a question mark on you and it's a question mark on your relevance as well. I think that more than anything else made the decision. Others argued the same point using terms such as the news value of the image overrode ethical considerations. This factor provides an insight into the nature of the news industry, wherein the viability of a news outlet relies in large part on its ability to maintain its own relevance in the eyes of news consumers. And increasingly, relevance is being defined by social media users raising questions about the gatekeeping function of journalists. A third factor that emerged is the distinction that news professionals draw across death images. Despite the controversy the image provoked, news professionals maintain that it is not a graphic image, because it doesn't have any visible injuries, blood, or gore that would qualify as potentially distressing content for viewers. One of the respondents likened Alan to a sleeping child. Others described the photos using terms such as haunting, beautiful, peaceful. Um, therefore, editors are mindful of the wide variation within death images, as some images, specifically those of violent deaths that depict maimed bodies, are considered more offensive to audiences than images of bodies that bear no marks of injury. Participants viewed Alan's photos as significant because they were part of a much larger story and tragedy, that of refugees desperately fleeing a war-torn country in search of a better life. Hence, Alan's photographs represent a larger tragedy. A correspondent in Australia, Ella, said the images became so powerful because of what they represented and the reflect a reflection they prompted among citizens of developed countries. Salman, an editor based in Pakistan, viewed the photos as part of a wider genre of photography that represents international crises by placing children at the heart of them. Other participants were also of the view that the impact of tragedies is intensified when they're linked with innocent children. James, an editor based in Australia, says that the image was published as it came to represent a horrific ordeal for refugees and its news value outweighed concerns about sensitivities to death images. Some of the news professionals referenced two images that are widely recognized and they came up over and over again. Um, 
The first is a starving Sudanese child, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning photo. Um, that is again a widely recognized image. And the second is accidental napalm attack, also a Pulitzer Prize winning photo. There appears to be some consensus that shocking images might have focused attention on important causes, and this warrants the breaching of editorial guidelines. Several participants admitted that in a new saturated environment, it is sometimes important to break past public apathy using shocking images that will compel audiences to pay attention. In this regard, images that are uncomfortable to view are utilized as part of a deliberate strategy to shock people into paying attention and thinking about issues. The news editor for Pakistani television channels spoke about this in particular detail. And he said that there was a need to use shocking imagery in the Pakistani news media context where people have become numb to stories of horror and violence. On the flip side, there are concerns among scholars that using images for their shock value may contribute to compassion fatigue and sensationalistic coverage might in turn breed desensitization. And so this strategy can only work if it's used sparingly. Several respondents ranked Allen's photos among other iconic images that have violated news conventions, but called attention to social issues and in doing so earned prestigious awards and recognition. These photos are widely recognized etched in public memory and have come to define how people visualize specific social contexts and conflicts. Participants likened Allen photos to other iconic images such as the starving Sudanese child and accidental napalm attack. Recognizing the iconic value of these photographs persuaded news editors to publish them, even if doing so meant contravening editorial guidelines. Another factor that was emphasized was um, that news images, which have traditionally been viewed as supplementary content uh, that complements or supports the news story that is primarily communicated using words or text. However, in this case, with Allen's photographs, this dynamic that privileges words over images was reversed. Social media editor at an Australian news website, Jennifer, spoke of the need, spoke of the central role of the image in telling Alan's story. Scholars such as Zelizer have argued for the need to publish images when the story cannot be told without them. And many of these participants agreed that this was one of those cases where the image was vital to telling the story. The concept of the public good has long been recognized as a fundamental component that guides the work of journalists. It's a key determinant of whether or not something qualifies as news and if it should be published. Participants such as James noted that the act of publishing the image was justified by the policy changes that it influenced. Indeed, studies show that the photographs influence public opinion and cause some countries to loosen their borders to refugees, however temporarily. Not all the participants were certain that publishing the images was the right choice and they did voice certain concerns about them in these interviews. Whether images of dead bodies should be published or not is ultimately a value-based decision. The research revealed that decision-making in such contexts is based on assessments of multiple interconnected, overlapping and sometimes contradictory factors, which call for nuanced judgments rather than tick the box criteria. Interestingly, the examples that were referenced in um, their decision-making by journalists are all drawn from non-Western contexts, as well as Alan's photographs that also feature a Syrian child. Therefore, future research should look into images of uh, journalistic treatment of traumatic images featuring children within Western contexts. Thank you. And thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, we've got some questions here. Um, your research found that uh, traumatic images um, can be more intense. Um, is there a group that received the reverse because of their social characteristics, i.e., unfortunately, the general viewers are expected not to respond to a particular group's traumas as much as children? So is there a group that received the reverse because of their social characters? That's, um, I, I didn't come across any group that would receive the reverse treatment. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry, can you go over the last part of that question again? Yeah, it's, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that, I think, for um, afterwards. I think it's, it's, it's more of a question to respond to in writing, um, but let's go to another one. Um, and uh, Christian asks, if the views of journalists whose news outlets were generally not supportive of immigration and refugees support, diff uh, was their support different from those of journalists working for outlets that were supportive? 
That's interesting. Um, I found that there was a lot of diversity among the journalist views themselves, and they did agree. Um, they didn't necessarily toe the line. Uh, in some cases, images were published and they did discuss that there was a lot of debate and discussion among their own team members. So it wasn't necessarily um, a larger policy decision on the part of the news outlet um, and their policy that was being projected, but larger, there were these discussions going on among the editorial teams themselves and which were heated discussions. They weren't necessarily unanimous decisions that were made. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of nuance even within this decision making. I don't think it's as simple as reflecting the, the organization's kind of policy. Yeah, and you mentioned that some of the um, news personnel you talked to really had uh, kind of misgivings about having run the photos, but they felt they kind of had to run it. Is that the overall sense you got? They were quite conflicted, yes. I, I think that there, were, there was a range of opinions. Some of them felt strongly that, no, it needed to be run. It was just too important an image. And mm -hmm. so people had to kind of deal with their discomfort around it. Others felt that they themselves were, were quite conflicted about doing so. But again, like, like I said earlier, it was a question of the greater good that those images could do. Um, and still others ran it, but they reached a compromise where they use the other image, which shows um, a policeman holding the child as opposed to the child lying on the beach, which they felt was marginally less uh, graphic than mm. the other image. So there was quite a lot of um, variation, even among their views of how strongly they felt the image should or shouldn't be used. Yeah, there's another question, and, and this raises an issue going back to kind of the visual meme um, um, discussion about the influence of words in relation to images. Now, the Kurdi images, at least on the beach, are so powerful that it seems like the words um, are going to have less of a consequence there. But what's your view on that, having, you know, looked at all these texts and images closely uh, and, and, you know, spoken with journalists? Well, that's an important one. I think something that they emphasized, a few of them really emphasized strongly was they said that this wasn't the first story that came out about refugees and you know refugees drowning along the way and bad things happening to them. It's just the most impactful image that really cut across. And um, so in a sense, none of the words that had been published, the stories that had been published, or even the images that had been used prior to this had really cut across um, in a way that was as impactful as this. Part of it was because it was a child Part of it was also because it was one individual that we were focused on, as opposed to like boats filled with refugees to capacity, uh, which kind of, in a sense, doesn't really, you don't relate as much to lots of people in a crowd as you do to one small child. Um, so, so in this sense, I mean, the, the fact that this image, many news professionals felt said something that other images weren't really able to say or convey as effectively. And so it just, it really helped. And perhaps that's why it was published by so many news outlets around the world. Another question, did you get the sense that um, journalists' views on the politics of migration or you know, the refugee crisis, even the Syrian war, were altered through their experience of reporting on this, um, particularly if they saw it up close? I mean, many of them did speak about how hard it was and it was a tough image for them to kind of make a call on. Um, they, they didn't necessarily um, talk about what they felt before or after, but they did say that the dealing with the story did kind of, it was particularly challenging in some ways because of the, the decision calls that they had to make. Um, but they also felt that this was, this was something that was really important to deal with. And, and overall, they agreed that despite their own discomfort, they ended up contravening their own guidelines for these reasons, because the story was, was too important to ignore. Mm -hmm. And then one question I just have is, did you um, ever brush up against the literature on iconic images? Would you call this an iconic image of um, the Syrian crisis? And what makes an, an image iconic uh, compared to another one? You mentioned there were other, um, you know, drowned refugees that were photographed, uh, but this one really resonated. Well, that's interesting because um, some of the literature around this, it's changed what was iconic in the past um, and, and some of those kind of considerably go back further. But when I was going through the literature, increasingly iconicity seems to be shared to be more influenced now by social media users in a sense and uh -huh. what's being, what's being uh, responded to on the web. So I found that discussion very interesting in the literature as well as among my interviews with people of well, what makes for an icon. Um, one aspect of it is that it speaks to something that really resonates with people and, and again, speaks to a larger issue overall, which people can identify with and something that, that turns historic events and causes shifts 
industry, but it's kind of easier to talk about in retrospect. Um, in this case, a lot of people felt that really what was one of the defining factors really was social media. The fact that this image spread so far and so wide uh, was something that people felt was really important. Did, did you conclude anything separate from that? So you've got your data from your interviews, but then you have your own impressions. Um, what was it about, about the image to you? I think that, um, that one of the, well, one of the factors that came up, and I think what was particularly powerful about this one was just that it was a child, it was a minor, um, and that brings a certain degree of power with it. It brings a certain degree of, uh, of emotion with it, which wasn't necessarily there in a lot of these other images that came about. Um, and, and the way, the image composition itself, the way that it's been framed again, it's able to kind of uh, toe that line between not being too offensive to viewers, but at the same time conveying a lot of sadness. So I think a lot of these factors from the composition to the person who is being portrayed in this image um, and do contribute to its iconic status. Mm -hmm. So that might be a really interesting follow-up. Um, just, you know, why this kind of seemed to achieve iconic status. I think if, if you showed people this one image, they would probably make that association where if you showed other images, it might be more ambiguous. Um, but it's also very consistent with stuff um, I found with... Um, Delia uh, Dimitrescu, and, and that is if you show um, individual kids, particularly in distress, then that generates the most sympathy and will cause um, people to pay attention and, and even kind of shift some of their policy support, although not everybody. Um, great. Well, thanks for that.